Hello there, I'm Jimmy Vegas and this is how to create a 3D Endless Runner in Unity and welcome to episode 4. In this tutorial we are going to code the ability to actually move our playable cube from side to side. Don't forget to click the subscribe button and click on the bell icon as well to stay up to date with every tutorial still to come this series and everything else on game development on my channel. With that in mind, let's get to work. So. There are actually two steps that I want to do in this tutorial, so two separate scripts. Uh, obviously we're going to deal with the play and move script and we're also going to deal with a new script which is going to control how far to the left or right we can actually move because at the moment we don't want to be able to come off the edge of this particular section uh, that we run on. So we're going to start by creating that script and it's going to be a boundary script so we can determine just how far we can go. So in the scripts folder, let's uh, right click, create an another folder. This one will be called environment. And in this folder, let's right click, create C sharp script. And we'll put this as level boundary. And let's open that up in Visual Studio. So you'll notice when we open this script up, it does appear the exact same as when we created the other script, that default layout of um, about 19, 20 lines of code, uh, which is basically just uh, the methods, uh, namespace and the class. So the way we're going to do this is going to be slightly different than the last script we used. We're going to create four variables. And what two of these variables are going to do is they're going to be able to talk to other scripts. So basically, we need our play and move script to be able to talk to this script to recognize just how far the boundaries are. Now, obviously, some levels may have larger boundaries than others. So that is why we're doing it this way, just so we've got more variation and range when it comes to defining the boundaries later on throughout development. So this is all loaded up now. And for some reason, it's loaded me straight into player move. That's not what I wanted. I wanted a level boundary. So yeah, like I say, there's the default 19 lines uh, right there. So we are going to do this inside the update method. So we don't need start and we don't need the annotations. So just like last time, we can get rid of those. So let's declare those four variables. Now, technically, we only need two, but the reason I'm um, in having four is because I want to be able to see. So I'll explain what I mean when we have all four variables declared. So public. And now, before we type the type of variable, we're going to put the word static. And what this will do, calling it static, is it will allow any script to kind of interact with this variable. That's the simplest way of putting it. When it's static like this, other scripts can interact with this variable. So now we put the type. So we're going to put float because it's probably going to be a decimal number at some point, but you know, it's always good to have a float rather than integer. It gives us a bit more range. And for this, we're going to have left side semicolon and then public static. And hopefully you know what's coming next. Yep. Right side. Now, those are the two variables I mentioned. Uh, we're going to have them also as floats, but they're not going to be static. So we can type public float and we'll call this one internal left semicolon. And then we'll have public float internal right semicolon. Now, why have I done this? Basically, as you saw in the previous tutorial, the variables here, so if we go and play a move, this uh, variable here of move speed, we could actually see that in the inspector panel, couldn't we? So if we go back to Unity, and if we click on the player, we can see it right there. So when a variable is static, it does not appear in the inspector panel. I always like to see, obviously for debug purposes and just to check things look okay, I always like to have something visible in the inspector panel. So the reason we now have this here is so we can do that. So we're going to say internal left equals left 
side. And then hopefully you've guessed it. Internal right equals right side, semicolon. Now I'm not gonna save the script just yet because we actually need to declare what these values are going to be, at least for now. So how far do we want our runner to go to the left? Well, I'm just gonna pan around so we can actually see. Now currently our player is on the X axis of zero. And if we move him this way to the left, he can go to negative two. And if we move him to the right, he can go to two. So depending on how wide you want your section of your floor to be. So for example, if we change this to, let's say uh, eight, then obviously the left and right sides become larger. So technically, we could go to 3.5 and negative 3.5. So I'm thinking we should probably do that. So let's keep this sand floor as eight and this one <clears throat> also as eight. <clears throat> so we have on the left side, negative 3.5 and on the right side, 3.5. So if I put here equals negative 3.5 F and on the right side equals 3.5. 5 F and save. So what we've basically done here is we have stated that these are the boundaries and we can access them from other scripts because they are static. So if we head back into Unity and I'm going to add a new game object which is going to be used for a lot of control in this game. So if we go game object, create empty and I'm going to have here level controls. And I'm going to place it at the top above main camera. Next, I'm going to drag and drop that level boundary onto level control. And you can see here that those two static variables do not exist here. They are still working in the script. They're just inside um, the script itself. So obviously that's why we have the internal ones so we can see what the values are going to be. So if I press play now, these should turn to negative 3.5 and 3.5. Cool. So we know that all works. So what do we do next? Well, we want to be able to move our player from left to right, but not go as far over. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to allow ourselves to move the player. That's the first step in this. And once we've got that working, we can then incorporate the boundary figures. So let's head back into Visual Studio and let's click on player move. Now this is all going to be done inside the void update. So after this line that we typed last time, the transform.translate line, we now need for it to recognize if we are pressing a key. So usually when it comes to a keyboard, it's A to move left or left key to move left or D to move right or the left arrow to move right. So we're going to use both of those just in case you want to use one or the other. So we can create an if statement that can say if we're pressing A or the left key, then move left. So to do that, we need to type if, and in brackets, input, and remember, capitalization is vital. It's so important. It's a capital I on input there. Make sure you do get the capitalization correct. So if input dot get key, and in brackets, we now need to tell it which key code that is. So we type, key code and basically if we put dot and a it will say yeah okay so if we're pressing a on the keyboard then do the following but because we've actually got more to this than that we need to close bracket close bracket and then we need the double bar symbol so usually that is shift and forward slash that will bring up the bar symbol. If you don't know which one I'm on about, on a keyboard, well, standard keyboard at least, it's the one next to the Z or Z key to the left of it. So it's the bar symbol. Two of them means or. It's probably also worth pointing out that if you have a double ampersand, uh, that means and. So they're the two main ones that we'd ever use, and and or. So basically we've said, if we're pressing the A key or input, dot get key and in brackets 
key code, if I can spell, key code dot left arrow. And then close that bracket. And let me just check this. Have I, I don't think I've done that right. So yeah, there we go. So just have to double, double, double make sure that in this instance, we only have one close bracket there because the open and close there in the parentheses there. So a double close, a du sorry, a double close bracket would have actually closed the if statement, but we want to close the if statement over here. So at this point, we've said if we're pressing A or the left arrow, then we need to do the following. So we open curly bracket and hit enter or return. And what this has done now is that it's created that if logic. So if we are pressing it, we need to do something. If we're not, then it doesn't matter too much at all. So this is probably a good time to bring in some, um, well, another variable, I should say, because I think it depends how fast you want to move. Do we want to move as fast left and right as we are forward, or do we want to change that? I like to have variation and the ability to change what we do. So I'm going to create another variable here. I'm going to put public float left right speed equals, and I'll have it as four. So I'm going to have it just a little bit higher. So that left right speed is going to determine just how fast we can move left or right. So much like we have with this section here, we now need to basically tell it to move left or right. And we can actually type pretty much the same kind of thing except use left. So in this case, we say transform dot translate. And in brackets, we type vector three dot left. And then we multiply that by time dot delta time again, because we want to make sure that we are all working in the same um, time space continuum, I guess. You know, you know what I mean? As long as it's working to the game's time, it's all good. Um, so once we've multiplied that by the time, we multiply once again by the left right speed. Now we don't need to have this uh, relative to space and world around it. So we can actually just close bracket and semicolon there. So that will now allow us to move left if we press the left key. So we need to do the same for the right key. So let's cheat a little bit. Let's actually take this, copy it, and let's now place it below. And instead of key code A, we want key code D. Instead of left arrow, we want right arrow. And now transform.translate vector3.left times um, time times left right speed. And this is where the clever bit comes in. We just now need to put times negative one. What will that do? It will invert the number. So if we're moving left at the speed of four, if we press the right key, we'll actually move left at the speed of negative four. So that means we will move right. So let's save that script now. And let's head back into Unity. If we click our player, we should see that extra variable and we do right there. So let's press play. And there we go. We can move left and right. So there's the A and D and now the arrows. Perfect. So like I said earlier, we need to get the left and right movement working. We've got that working. So now let's set another if statement to make sure that we are not overgoing the boundaries. Now it's a bit of uh, logical working out this. So we have to kind of understand that when we are pressing the left key, we're going to have to check, is our position greater than the left side? If it is, then we can move. So here in the first if statement, we've got if input got, uh, key A. The next section would be another if statement. So we're nesting this if statement. 
if and in brackets this dot game object and that is a lowercase g and an uppercase o so what we're doing is whatever object that this script will be attached to is referred to as this so if this dot game object dot transform dot position dot x because basically we want to check if the x position of this object is greater than level boundary dot left side and then open curly bracket and now if we delete the close curly bracket go to the next line of code hit return and then close curly bracket it will automatically indent it for you just to kind of keep that flow quite neat and tidy so what we've done here is we've said if we're pressing a then go to the next line if our position is greater than the left side then we can move left if it's not we don't do anything at all so then we have to repeat that same process for pressing the d or right arrow so here we can say if this dot game object dot transform dot position dot x is less than level boundary dot right side then open curly bracket delete the close curly bracket hit return on the next line down and then close curly bracket and save so we've got a couple of nested if statements here, which is basically saying that if we are at the boundary, we can't move any further. If we're not, then we can move. So finally, if we head back into Unity and press play, we should be able to move left and right up to the edge right there. So we cannot move any further left, no matter how much we try. Can't move any further right no matter how much we try. So, if you do have a problem with the script, I will upload this script to uh, the website. If you head over there, downloads and assets, endless runner, tutorial number four, and you can download it right there. Next tutorial, what we're going to do is we are going to bring in our character. So we are going to basically import a 3D model character, but it needs to be set up just right so we can use it correctly when it comes to coding a little later on. So until that next tutorial, Thanks very much for watching, guys.